you're welcome for the really long day that you're going to have today. Wait, 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 who said you could sit down? Listen, if I'm standing, we're in this together, right? No, really, seriously, stand back up. You, ha- you didn't exercise today, so you might as well stand up for a second. <clears throat> so just stand up for this part, and then you, I promise you you'll sit down. So the thing is, I have started, I, uh, I'm an idiot. I decided to go back to school to get my master's. And so there's some weeks I'm in classes, and so I had to wait till they gave me the schedule before I could say yes. So I'm sorry, but you're welcome for the long conference. Anyway. <laughs> Um, thanks so much for having me. She's just like the sweetest person, Tammy, isn't she? She's just like, I think she's a little bit of a steel magnolia. Do you know, like sweet, but steel. And I love that. I love that. And, um, I was standing in the back during Alicia's session and she's one of my favorite humans. She's, she's I used to try to take notes in her sessions. I don't, nah. I'm just going to listen, and I'll listen again and take notes the second time because the first time I'm just hearing it, and there's just so many bombs that God gives you and drops on us, and I'm grateful to be on the same team as you and building the kingdom and building the church and uh, just love you, yes. and you have the best here. And um, <laughs> I'm going to be a little bit different. Is that okay? Yes. See, God uses different pieces of a puzzle to actually create the whole. So I'm going to be the loud, a little bit sassy, maybe a touch rude. I'm from L.A. We get away with stuff like that. Is that all right? Why don't you grab the hand of the girl next to you? If you wipe the sweat off yours, it'll make it better for her. (laughs) And uh, we're going to pray for her. Father, I thank you for this amazing woman I'm standing next to. And I thank you, God, that it's uh, your kingdom that rules in her life, that your will is done in her life. And I pray, God, that she would experience your favor, your blessing, your wisdom. And I thank you, God, that the plans of the enemy over her life will fail and your plans will succeed. And I thank you, God, for her. In Jesus' name. Okay, squeeze some cheeks. Either pair work. Now you can have a seat. There are um, some annoying parts in the Bible, and uh, one of the annoying parts to me was uh, Proverbs 31. Anybody ever read that chapter? <clears throat> because who could be her, right? It was just like, yeah, she's so perfect and kind of had it all together. And, and then the verse that really challenged me was Proverbs 31, verse 15, which says, she rises while it is yet night. And I'm thinking, no, no, she doesn't. Right, she sleeps really good while it is yet night, right? But then when I began to actually study and just dissect that chapter, which actually, BTW, is your blueprint, when I began to actually study that and that verse in particular, I found out that it doesn't have as much to do with the time of day that you get up, but rather when darkness and chaos and heartbreak and disasters all around, she rises. And do you know what? God is looking for a company of she who will make the decision that when adversity is surrounding her, she rises. She doesn't blame. She doesn't whine. She doesn't complain. She doesn't point fingers. She doesn't wish she was anywhere else. She rises. So be those girls. You know, the death and resurrection of Jesus changed the course of history. You know, he was betrayed by people that he loved, people he had served with. Anybody know that feeling? He was He was beaten, he was crucified, he died. He went through some dark moments and then three days later he rose from the dead. We actually can rise because he did. The thing is, there is no rising, no resurrection without a death. So if you feel like you're in the middle of a dark, scary, shaky time, this is the perfect circumstance for arising. Yay! (laughs) Isaiah 60 says, Arise, shine, for your light has come, for the glory of the Lord rises upon you. See, darkness covers the earth, and thick darkness is over the peoples. Sounds like today, doesn't it? But the Lord rises upon you, and his glory appears over you. Nations will come to your light, and kings to the brightness of your dawn. God is looking for a company of women, a company of she, 
who in the midst of a world gone crazy will actually make the decision to rise. So there's a few areas that I'm going to talk about just for the moments I have up here where we are supposed to be rising and, and knowing who we are. First of all, she rises in royalty. She knows who she is. Psalm 45 refers to you and me as daughters of kings, as daughters of kings are among your honored women. Now, for some of you in here, perhaps you've heard that, and maybe you have been on this journey for years, you know, 25 years ago when I first got the picture, perhaps it was for me, it was the revelation that she is the daughter of a king, that she is a princess, there is a crown on her head, and I've been teaching that and underscoring that and threading that through almost every message that I give. And so maybe you've heard that, but maybe there's some of you in here, and actually, you've never heard that. So let me tell you, you are royalty. God is your father. You are a daughter of the king. There is a crown on your head. Look at that girl next to you and say, whoa, whoa yours is slipping. <laughs> you are loved and valued. Listen to me. Regardless of where you are or what you've been doing, you are loved and valued. Proverbs 31 also tells us in verse 10, it says your price is far above rubies. And Psalm 45 says the king is wild for you. And then Hebrews tells us, as Tammy mentioned earlier, that we can come boldly to the throne of grace so we can obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Do you know why? Do you know why you can actually come boldly into the throne room? You know why you'll receive mercy and grace? Because you're his daughter. You are royalty. You belong in the throne room of your God. She rises in royalty. And she rises in wisdom. Proverbs 31, 26 says she opens her mouth in skillful and godly wisdom, and on her tongue is the law of kindness, giving counsel and instruction. Now, the Hebrew word for that is the word chakam, and what it means is we, is giving a divine perspective. This is saying you and I should be capable, because we have a relationship with God, we should be capable of stepping into situations and giving the divine perspective. Not opinion, divine perspective. Uh, a few years ago, I was getting on an airplane, and I had my boarding pass, and I was headed to my seat, and I'm getting to my seat, and I noticed that there is a gentleman in there, and I said, excuse me, sir, but you're in my seat. And he said, I know, but I just want to sit with my wife. Is that okay? And I'm like, sure. So we exchange boarding passes, and now I'm headed to my second seat, and I get there, and I notice that there is a, a woman in my seat, and I say, excuse me, ma'am, but you're in my seat. And she says, I know, but I just need to do some work with a coworker. Is that okay? <laughs> okay. So now, third boarding pass. Headed down the seat, and I get to that seat, and I see that there's a teenage boy in there, and I go, hey, buddy, out of my seat. <laughs> and then he looks at me, he goes, oh, I know, ma'am, I, I know I'm in your seat, but I, I, I want to play some video games with my friend next to me. Is that okay? Yeah. Fourth boarding pass. So I continue walking down the plane and I see the seat where my newly assigned seat and it's empty, so I just get in, I'm in. And then I happen to look next to me and there is a gentleman sitting there and I, I give him the airplane smile, you know. <laughs> and, um, and then I, you know that smile. And then I pull out a book, which in international plane language means, don't talk to me, some of you speak it, that is awesome. <laughs> This guy, he did not speak it. And he looks at me and says, hey, you know, my name's Bill. What's your name? Holly. Holly. He says, oh, well, nice to meet you, Holly. And what do you do for a living? <sighs> well, honestly, I find that question interesting because I think I, I'm, I'm a woman. I do nine things before lunch, okay? <laughs> right? Like for me, I'm going to be a pastor, I'm a teacher, I'm an author, I'm a student, I'm a mother, I'm a wife, I'm a chauffeur, I'm a chef, I'm a lover, I'm a friend. You know, we do a lot of things, right? In fact, you know, when you, tr when you travel uh, into different countries, there is always the customs form, the immigration form, and they have a place for you to put occupation. And I change that every time. <laughs> Just to keep my own self entertained with my life. <laughs> So I change it all the time. I'm pretty sure that's illegal, and um, so visit me in jail if that's true. But I was flying into Australia one time, and on that form, you know, what do you, you know, occupation, I wrote lover. I went six in the morning, I'm delirious. And so we get there, and we get to the little customs boxes, and 
So I'm in line with my paper, and I happen to get the one where th th there's a really young man in there. I mean, I'm pretty sure it was his first day, and he, I'm not sure he was shaving yet. I mean, just like young, young. And so I just slide that little thing under there. Like within minutes, I could see like red, you know, start <laughs> making the journey. <laughs> and he like stamps it and just like shoves it back to me. Anyway, so all that to say, I change it all the time, depending, you know, on the circumstance. So now I'm sitting on an airplane next to this man, and I'm thinking, what can I say that will end this conversation? <laughs> so I look at him, and I say, actually, I'm a pastor of a church. Jesus, blood on the cross, church. <laughs> and then... He looks at me and he goes, I've been needing to talk to a pastor. Ah! <laughs> ah! So now I panic because I think he's, he's going to want to know like difficult stuff. He's going to want me to explain Leviticus, right? Or the tribulations or dispensation. Like, I'm sorry, I'm sorry to panic. But honestly, I should have known God better than that. And so this man, he looks at me and uh, he says, well, actually, um, my wife and I just found out that she's pregnant with triplets and, uh, and our marriage is not that great. So are there any tips, any bit of wisdom that you could give me to build a marriage? And inside, I'm thinking, yes. Right? I've been married to the same man 33 years in a row. Right? <laughs> we write books on marriage. We do conferences on marriage around the planet. So yes, there's a few things I could share. So, but I look at him, and with men, by the way, less is more. I'm not just talking about clothes, but words, right? So <laughs> with him, I give him three simple things that he can do. Start now, three simple things he can do, and then I pray with him, we just have a moment, and then we go about our, the rest of the flight. So did you see what God did there? He moved four people out of the way so that I would have a chance to be in a place where I could actually open my mouth and offer wisdom. And I started thinking, how many times does that happen every day? Every day, God is positioning people and he's putting his people in a place where you might have a chance to open your mouth and actually help someone. But sometimes we're so focused on our own self, our own pain, what we're, what we're dealing with, we don't see what God might be positioning us to do. Wisdom. Wisdom is making the best use of knowledge, experience, and understanding. And what I know is that most of us in this room, we have paid a high price for the wisdom we have learned. Wisdom Proverbs 5 that, is, that says is learned by actual and costly experience. You know, there's some of you who have overcome tremendous obstacles on your journey through life. And there are women out there who need to know how you did it. You know, perhaps as a single mom, you managed to raise your children and to responsible adults. Amazing. Well, what I guarantee you is that there is a woman in your circle of influence who needs to know what you did and how you did it. And some of you, perhaps you've graduated from college or gotten a, an advanced degree. Well, I, what I know is that there's a young college student in your circle of influence, and she's freaking out. She wants to quit. She needs to know what you know. And then some of you, you know, perhaps you've lived through tremendous abuse, and you have found the path of healing. Well, what I can guarantee you is that there's a woman in your circle of influence who is still trapped in it. She needs your help. She needs the wisdom that you have. Some of you perhaps had an abortion or had an addiction of some kind, I imagine there is some wisdom you can share. Wisdom, not just opinion. A lot of those going around. Wisdom. Wisdom. Be willing to open your mouth with wisdom and help someone else who might be facing the same journey that you're facing. Yes? She rises in royalty, she rises in wisdom, she rises in freedom. Harry Houdini, who was a pretty famous escape artist back in the day, he issued a challenge wherever he went, and 
he could be locked, he claimed he could be locked in any jail cell in the country and he would set himself free very quickly. And, and he always kept his promise, but one time something went wrong and Houdini entered the jail cell in his street clothes and these heavy metal doors clanged shut behind him. And he took from his belt this concealed piece of metal, which was strong and flexible, and he set to work immediately. Uh, uh, but something seemed to be unusual about this lock, and for 30 minutes, he got nowhere. And then an hour passed, and he still hadn't opened the door, and by now he was sweating, and he was exasperated, and he could not pick the lock. And then finally, after laboring for two hours, Harry Houdini just collapsed in frustration against the door that he could not unlock, but when he fell against the door, it swung open because it had never been locked at all. But in his mind, it had been locked. And that was actually all it took to keep him from opening the door and walking out of the jail cell. And what I've seen in women all over the world is that even though they have been given freedom in Jesus, they're not living it. You know, on this one particular day, Jesus enters a synagogue, as was his custom every Sabbath, and he reads from the book of Isaiah, and it's recorded in Luke 4. It says, Luke 4, verse 18, it says, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me, the anointed one, the Messiah, to preach the good news, the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to announce release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to send forth as delivered those who are oppressed, who are downtrodden, bruised, crushed, and broken down by calamity. And I started thinking, do you know, from a thematic perspective, this passage in scripture just might be the central passage of the gospel. This passage contains a mission statement from Jesus about his ministry on earth. And everything he did in the months and years following was acting out this verse. You know, at the cross, God took all of the sin of mankind and placed it on Jesus. And he hung on that cross between heaven and earth, paying the death penalty for every man, woman, and child. And as he hung bleeding, scripture records that he called out, it is finished. And I like to think that in those words, it is finished, what he is yelling out is freedom. Freedom for you and freedom for me. He unlocked the door. And yet sometimes I wonder if like Harry Houdini, we aren't living as if the door of our life is locked. Jesus came to set us free those of us who might be feeling oppressed or crushed or broken down. I mean, have you ever felt like that? Whether you feel like you've been trapped in a thought pattern or a sin or an addiction or fear or worry, he has come to set us free from that. Galatians 5, it says, in this freedom, Christ has made us free and completely liberated us. So stand fast and don't be hampered and held, ensnared and submit again to a yoke of slavery, which you once put off. So how do we do that? How do we rise in freedom? Well, in many cases, walking in freedom is a process. It is a fight. So don't quit. And part of the process is making different decisions or you'll end up back in chains. We've been freed, so we have to actually now live differently if we're going to live in freedom. You know, sometimes people want to define freedom as doing what you want. I'm free. I can do what I want and when I want it. And you know what? You certainly can. It just may not produce the freedom that you actually want. Understanding freedom is a, is a bit like understanding kite flying. You know, if the wind is strong, the kite goes higher and it grows smaller and smaller as it tugs against the string. And the harder the wind blows, then the higher the kite rises. But then let's say the string breaks. The kite is now free, but it no longer soars higher. It tumbles and crashes to the ground, maybe and gets tangled in trees. So what kept the kite airborne was the restraint of the string. And when that is lost, the kite was unable to fly. When that was lost, see, we'll never be freed until we're restrained by something that pulls us higher and higher. It's not the absence of restraint that makes us free. There is no freedom in life until one belongs to God. We find the freedom to achieve the greatest desires of our lives only when we live in that relationship. And so what I realize is that every day, we make choices, whether it's in our marriage or at work or with our friends, that can bring freedom or not. Freedom is found in whose restraints we choose to live under. Now, there are perhaps a lot of areas of freedom that I could talk about, but I'm just going to talk about one right here. Freedom. She rises in freedom. I am free 
to be who God has, create, who has created me to be, uniquely created, uniquely purposed. You are free to be who God has created you to be. You know, creation, we, when we read the creation stories, as creation was good. And then we were created in his image. He formed every cell, every curve, every lash. Well, some of you got the fake ones on, but you know what I mean. And then he looks at us and he says, we were very good. Not just good, but very good. Breathtaking, phenomenal. And in light of all else he created, he calls us his masterpiece. We each in this room bear the mark of our creator. Whether we're tall or short, curvy or slim, thick or dark, light or Asian, European, native, African, Latino, multiracial, we all bear the fingerprint of our creator. I read some articles in a newspaper about some Indian women, women from India, paying to have their skin bleached. Of Asian women, undergoing eye surgery to make their eyes rounder. Who decided that light skin and round eyes was the definition of beauty? And then a friend of mine, who herself is a mixture of a few different ethnicities, she told me that on one hand, with some of her friends, she's too light, and then with some other friends, she's too dark. And then some black friends of mine have explained the issue of good hair and bad hair. You know, good hair being easier to be straightened, but who said that? Do you see where we fell for this? And then there's a story told on the news about some Japanese women having surgery to put steel rods in their legs in order to increase their height. Who decided that being tall was more beautiful? Psalm 139, see, in the light of a culture that screams that nonsense as us, we have to scream back Psalm 139. You made all the delicate inner parts of my body. You knit me together in my mother's womb. Thank you, God, for making me so wonderfully complex. Your workmanship is marvelous how well I know it. I mean, why is it that we can look at flowers, which are all different, and call each one beautiful, and yet we look at each other and not see the beauty? We are each created as his masterpiece. The introvert, the extrovert, the risk taker, the cautious, the talker, the listener, each of us with a purpose designed to make him famous, not us, him. So whether you stay at home with your kids or work at the office or play sports or sing songs or dance or teach from a stage, we're each free to live in the wonder of being uniquely created, which makes us free from comparison, just free to live as the accepted daughter of the king. And for some of you, maybe just hearing that today will be the key that unlocks freedom. So if you'll allow me just one little pastor old over 50 moment. Maybe some of you just might want to limit your social media scrolling. Because I'm not sure that always produces in you what you want it to. Now, I think it's fun, and I love when people put prayer requests up because I get to pray, and I know thousands of people are praying about whatever that situation is. But oftentimes, we see someone's life, you know, their highlight reel, and we get this thing in us. And so I'm just saying maybe, maybe you just might want to be aware of what's happening in your own heart. If that's causing you to compare as opposed to rejoicing with someone. I just saying. <laughs> All right, she rises in royalty. She rises in wisdom. She rises in freedom. And she rises in gratitude. Everyone wants to be grateful. I mean, who wants to be ungrateful? <laughs> but the question is, what's your plan to become a more grateful person? How are you going to do that? Because I found that nobody just drifts into gratitude. Right? We say thank you when someone does something for us, or thank you when we are given a gift, and we should. But if we start to think that we'll be grateful to the extent that we receive things or the more good things we have, the more grateful we'll become, then gratitude becomes a product of our circumstances. And gratitude is always a decision of the heart, not a result of circumstances. I mean, have you ever noticed that two people can be in the same situation? The same job, perhaps, the same school, the same long line at Starbucks, the same church, and one of them 
is filled with gratitude, and the other one's just like a whiny person. Perhaps it's because what some people perceive as a gift, somebody else sees as their right. You know, Paul teaches us that gratitude is the will of God. He says this in 1 Thessalonians 5.18. He says, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ. A thankful heart is more than a good idea. It's the will of God for his people. So many times, we're wondering, God, what's your will for my life? As a pastor, that's probably one of the number one questions I get asked, is how do I figure out what God's plan is for my life, what God's purpose is for my life, what is God's will for my life? Well, the first step is right there in front of us. The will of God is not this mystical cloud that descends, and you're trying to figure out where it might blow in from. No, it's not that mystical. So many people are paralyzed. They just don't know how to take the next step. Well, how about the next step, just being grateful? Just be grateful. Start by being grateful. You know, maintain a gratitude journal. For those of you who love to journal, instead of like all your feelings. But, well, okay, you can do that too. But at the bottom, maybe write something you're thankful for, right? Or before your feet hit the floor in the morning, just think of one thing that you're grateful for. We have this jar in our house that my husband calls our gratitude jar. And he did this because it came out of a really difficult season for us. About four years, three years ago, I don't know, three and a half, whatever it was, um, began a really challenging season. It started with my father dying suddenly. Now he fell and hit his head and had a brain bleed and I was very close to my dad. He loved me very well. So I, I was missing my dad. And just when I'm grieving the loss of my father, then someone steals our identity and somehow gets through the email that they hacked, they got into our bank account and stole our savings account. And I mean, the FBI got involved in all of that, but because of how it was done, we actually never got it back. So grieving the loss of my father, and then we have this financial loss, and then my husband gets diagnosed with cancer. And... uh, we begin the process with him and then the treatment was pretty brutal for him and it so compromised his immune system that uh, he gets shingles, which is this nerve condition that actually lasted for four months and he couldn't really walk, he couldn't function. And you know, men are amazing. (laughs) You know, until they're sick, right? I mean, I mean, granted, this was more than a common cold, okay? So it's a pretty intense journey. So um, we're walking through some of this, and so I'm, you know, trying to navigate him and how bad he feels, and, you know, then it affects his his soul and just, like, navigating him and then trying to lead a church and still grieving the loss of my dad and feeling financial stuff. So we're all kind of in the midst of this. And then there were some people who should have had my back in this season, people that I had extended grace to when they were a hot mess and and seen them grow up in Christ, people that I had extended grace to, and when I needed that grace, I didn't get it back. I got stabbed in the back. So I'm navigating betrayal of some people who were dear to me. So in the midst of this, it just felt terrible. And so this is when Philip goes, putting this jar in our kitchen. This is our gratitude jar. And I'm like, well, good luck with that. (laughs) But he's the Christian in our marriage. And um, (laughs) every marriage should have one. And uh, so we have this jar. And then he said, put these post-it notes next to the jar. And he said, so... Every morning, we're going to come down and write something we're thankful for and put it in the jar. I was like, "Mm -mm." (laughs) mm-mm. But I knew it was scriptural. And uh, so I come down. I come down in the morning. I'm just like, oh. And I'm looking at it. And and I got nothing. I just got nothing. I'm just standing there. And I'm just, all I can think about is how sad and frustrated and angry I am and people I want to hurt and... So I'm standing there, and I'm just looking out the window, and I'm standing there, and I go, actually, coffee. (laughs) Right? Aren't we thankful for coffee? Okay. So then day two, I come down to the kitchen, and I'm looking at this jar that I want to throw at his head, and uh, 
I take another note, and I'm looking, I'm like, oh, coffee. <laughs> then day three, I come down, I'm looking at that, and, uh, yeah, it's pretty much still coffee. Um, and then day four, I come down, I'm like, hmm, sunshine, which is not unusual here in Southern California, right? But, okay, sunshine. And then eventually, it became, you know, my kids, and my husband and some people and, you know, God's grace. And eventually it got there, but it didn't start there. And I, let me tell you, I never felt like doing it. It was a decision of the heart. So maybe, by the way, my husband's doing great, by the way. I always forget to say that part. <laughs> Praise God. Um, so maybe create a list of benefits in your life and ask yourself, to what extent do I take these for granted and instead be thankful? There's a man named Dr. Dale Robbins, and he wrote this. He said, I used to think that people complained because they had a lot of problems, but I've come to realize that they have problems because they complain. <laughs> See, complaining doesn't ch change anything or make situations better. It just amplifies frustration. It spreads discontent and discord. Complaining makes us miserable. The psalmist wrote this in Psalm 77. I complained and my spirit was overwhelmed. So basically God is saying just don't wait to be grateful. Don't postpone gratitude until your situation changes or until you've acquired a certain thing because if you can't be grateful now, you won't be grateful then. Because gratitude is not a matter of what you have or what situation you're in. If you've been saying I'll be grateful when then you actually never will be. Because as soon as that condition is met, there'll be a dozen more in front of it. Even the things that we most often complain about, let's be grateful. So also in this season, I decided, okay, some of the things that I most often complain about, just my everyday complaining, I'm gonna turn it around and be thankful. So here is my list you can work on your own. I said, I am grateful for, I'm grateful for the traffic I'm driving in because it means I have a car. I'm grateful for the spot I find at the far end of the parking lot because it means I'm actually capable of walking. I'm grateful for a bad hair day because it means I have hair. Listen, if you've had cancer, you get that. I'm grateful for my water bill because it means I can get water simply by turning on a faucet. I'm grateful that I live in a country where the chances of me being beheaded from my faith are fairly small. I'm grateful for all of the complaining I hear about our government because it means we have the freedom of speech. I'm grateful for scary, feel like throwing up, walk on water moments, because it means I'm getting to use my faith. I'm grateful for challenges in relationships because it means I have relationships worth fighting for. I'm grateful. I'm grateful for the alarm that goes off ridiculously early in the morning because it means God's trusted me with another day. Grateful. She rises in gratitude. See, part of the concept of rising is being different than the culture you see around you. Right? When everybody else is complaining, she's rising with gratitude. So make your own list. All right, I'm going to end with this thought. She rises, so she rises in royalty. She rises... In wisdom, she rises in freedom, she rises in gratitude, and last one, she rises with hope. A few years ago, Philip and I had the chance to tour the ancient catacombs in Rome where thousands of early Christians are buried. And as an expression of their faith, when a believer died, there was a Christian symbol that would be carved on their tombstone. And hundreds of different symbols would, you know, would, were written, or in these tombstones were hundreds of different symbols. And, and, you know, there was a fish, there was a shepherd, there was an anchor. Maybe the anchor 
was from this verse in Hebrews 6, 19. It says, we have this hope as an anchor for the soul, firm and secure. Now, what hope is the author talking about? Maybe that God keeps his promises? Maybe the hope that his love never fails? Maybe the hope that the work that he began in you, he's actually going to finish? I've heard that people can live about 40 days without food, three days without water, eight minutes without air, but they can actually only live one second without hope. Hope is more than optimism. In the New Testament, the biblical definition of hope implies a knowing. It is a sure expectation. Because see, when hopelessness fills your heart, a death begins to take over. Death to your dreams, death to a relationship worth saving, death to the idea that things will get better. But the power of hope coursing through your veins can be your most valuable asset because it creates this tremendous force within you. Hope is not a luxury. Hope is essential. And hope is for all of us, not just those glass half full people. Hope is not wishing. It is not positive thinking. It is a sure expectation that God will do what he promised. Hope is like floaties. Have you ever seen children in a pool wearing these little, you know, flotation armbands to keep their heads above water? Right? Well, hope is like that. It keeps you floating until you get to solid ground. I have this friend who suffers from an eating disorder, and many people told her that she would actually always struggle with it. They told her that she might get help for a moment, but that the disorder would be a continual battle for her. She was just floundering in the midst of those words. And when I spoke to her about a year ago, I assured her that there would come a day in which this issue would no longer be her struggle, that she could get free. I told her stories of many women who have wrestled with this challenge, and they're now free. They did the work of dealing with the issues in their soul, and they let the Holy Spirit bring transformation, and they're now completely on the other side of it, healed. I reminded her that the same God who started the work in her, that he actually would finish it. I reminded her of her value. And so my words of encouragement and hope, in a, in, but more importantly, actually God's words, put floaties on her. So what are you in the middle of where hope seems lost? I mean, maybe you've lost your job. Maybe your husband had an affair. Maybe you can't seem to kick that addiction. Or perhaps your child is really struggling. Or maybe you've heard the word cancer from your doctor. Or perhaps you just feel stuck in a dead-end job. Or maybe you're wondering if the secret dream in your heart, if it'll actually ever come to pass. So how is hope possible? Well, the Old Testament prophet Jeremiah, he has an answer. He said this. He said, I'll never forget the trouble, the utter lostness, the taste of ashes, the poison I've swallowed. I remember it all. Oh, how well I remember the feeling of hitting the bottom. But there's one other thing I remember. And remembering I keep a grip on hope. God's loyal love couldn't have run out. His merciful love couldn't have dried up. They're created new every morning. How great your faithfulness. I'm sticking with God. I say it over and over. He's all I've got. You know, sometimes the most important thing you can do is keep hoping. And oftentimes to keep a grip on hope will take both hands. So where are you drowning? Put on those floaties. It is not the end of the story. It is not the end of the story. You know, I, uh, in that season that was so challenging for us, um, I remember reading in Psalm 6 where David is just expressing his hurts and his pains. And in one place in the Psalms, it says David cried so many tears that, you know, soaked his pillow. And that made me feel real good, like in a sick sort of way. Right? If David's crying, I feel good, good company. But David's hope came from knowing that he was not alone. Neither was I, and neither are you. It might feel overwhelming what you perhaps are in the middle of right now. It's understandable, but you will get through this. You will get through this, and here's the, here's the kicker. Not only will you get through this, but however you get there, at some point you're going to help somebody else who's navigating the same storm. God never wastes a hurt. I, um, I really love confetti. I just do. I love it. I 
love being in a room when confetti cannons are launched. Like, not the little, I mean, that's okay. But the ones that just blow, and there's like, it's everywhere, and down your shirt, and you know, you go to the bathroom, and it falls out on the floor. I love it. I love it when it's in a room, and you make like confetti angels on the floor. I love confetti. Because how could you not laugh in the middle of a confetti storm? I mean, unless you're the people that have to clean it up, in which case, I'm sorry. But um, one of my favorite verses is 2 Corinthians, Corinthians 2.14. And in the message translation, it says this, In Christ, we are led from place to place in one perpetual victory parade. Now, Paul, when he's writing this, he was referring to the victory parade that Caesar gave when one of his conquering Roman generals succeeded in a military campaign. Now, the conquering general was pulled in this great chariot, pulled by white horses, and he was followed by his army, and he would approach the capital, and cheering crowds would line the streets, and there was dancing and music and shouting and confetti. I'm pretty sure about that. And, and they all were sharing in this celebration that Caesar threw on behalf of of this conquering military leader. What an amazing sight it must have been. So the picture Paul is painting for you and me is this. Jesus is our conquering general. We're a part of his army, and we share in the parade. He's leading us in one perpetual victory parade. So we have to see ourselves riding in the parade. We might be in the middle of a challenging, dark moment, but we're not trudging through a world of misery just hanging on. No! We are in the victory parade. It might feel like we're in the darkest, scariest moments, and I know what that feels like, but it doesn't change the fact that God is leading us in one perpetual victory parade. See, I believe this scripture is saying not that we're fighting for victory, but we are fighting from a place of victory. Jesus paid a tremendous price for us to walk in this parade, to live out a life of hope. But I just want to tell you, it is not the end of the story. So contrary to what others might say, you put those floaties on and you get some confetti. I travel with confetti. <laughs> really? Ask my husband. I always have a bag. You have one right now in my carry-on bag. And I have this one because Rachel, my friend, brought it to me. And in the middle of that really hard season, when it just felt like all hell was coming against us, I could see myself... Let me just be honest. In the middle of that season, do you know what started happening? I started getting bitter and cynical about people. And I felt like God showed me a picture of who that woman would become. And she was this bitter, old, twisted woman. And I didn't want to be her. So I knew I had to let go of the bitterness. I had to let go of the rage, the cynicism. And I had to rise with hope. And so I went out in my backyard, all by myself. I went out there with a bag of confetti. And I walked around my backyard, and I said, thank you, God, that you are leading me in the victory parade. I will put my hope in you. What you have begun in me, you will finish. I am never giving up. I will always follow you. Greater are you that lives in me. I'm going to choose gratitude. <laughs> It's always a decision. So I'm just saying, whatever you might be in the middle of, grab some confetti. You walk around your own yard. Because let me just tell you, life's not going to get easier. Maybe you're living with that thought. Whoop, wake up call. <laughs> but here's the thing. Life is full of its challenges. The world is full of heartbreak and chaos. But God trusted you with this moment. He trusted you at this time in history. You could have been born any time, but he trusted you with now. This means he thinks you have within you what it is to actually rise in the midst of this adversity, rise in the midst of challenge, and be the girl that love holds, be the girl of influence, be the one that makes a difference. Not retreating, not going, oh, this is too hard. I'm living behind my Orange County fence. <laughs> God's trusted you with this moment. There are people in your neighborhood, in your community, in your schools who need to see the girl that rises in the midst of challenge. Yes? Yes. Let me pray with you. Father, I thank you so much for your word, which is so full of challenge and promise and direction and instruction. And I thank you 
I thank you, God, that the girls in here will be the she that rises in royalty, in wisdom, in freedom, in gratitude, in hope. We're not going to be the retreating ones, but we will be the ones that rise. And God, I know there are women here in the midst of challenge, and I thank you that you are right there with them. You know their name, you know their situation, you know their circumstance. They are not lost or forgotten, not for one second. And I thank you, God. It's not the end of the story. I thank you that you will see them through. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Hey, and um, <laughs> before I turn... You have the cutest haircut. Oh, thank you. You're just so sassy. You know, my hair was your length, and then the two kids, I had toddlers, and I was okay. like, okay, go shorter. Okay. So. Well, I, go, I don't have toddlers, so yeah. it might stay this length. You never know. Yeah. Um, you never know. I think hair is so cool, you can just change it. And, and uh, So I just want to let you know, um, there's a book out there from my world called Find Your Brave. And it, I wrote it out of that season that was just full of challenge. And I just think, again, that we're living in a time when God is looking for his daughters to actually... He's counting on us to be the she that takes your place. It's not overcome by circumstance. And so this is just about finding your brave. And there, uh, the biblical through line of this is, um, so it's my story, and I'm pretty honest with just some of the challenges. But the biblical through line is the Apostle Paul was a prisoner on a ship headed to Rome, and it encountered a shipwreck, and it looked like all was going to be lost. But he made some decisions in the middle of that dark moment that saw everybody get to shore safely. And so I'm thinking there's some decisions we could probably make so that when the sun comes up, we're actually at a place we want to be and not totally shipwrecked. Yep, so it might be a help to you. Anybody right now, you're just in the middle of, ah! Okay, right there. You right there with the glasses. Come here, I'm going to give it to you. I love that you're smiling. You're awesome. Bless you. Hey, listen, if you're not in the middle of a blah right now, your turn's next week. Really. I mean, I wish, I wish that life was mountaintop, 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 heaven. But it isn't, is it? It's mountaintop. Mountaintop. But you know what I found? Fruit doesn't grow on the mountaintops. Fruit grows in the valleys. And he'll equip you. He'll lead you through that valley too. All right, God bless.